With Majora's Mask 3D being released and all the multitude of changes it brings, I think it's a good time to look back at the original Majora's Mask and all the differences between the Japanese and North American releases of the game. Later on in the video I'll be going over some of the unused content still left over within the game's files. Most people don't know that there were any differences, and who can blame them? There's really not much reason to change a game when being shipped over a distance. The most you'll usually ever find is that the difficulty modes are a bit different, and maybe some fixed glitches. In Majora's Mask, however, there are several rather large differences strewn throughout the entire game, and I'd like to take this video to tell you about them. For this video, I'll be taking footage for the Japanese version from the N64 cartridge, and the North American version from the Collector's Edition, which means the footage is captured at only 480i. But I wanted to make this as authentic as possible, so no emulators. It's worth noting that there are some minor changes from the North American N64 cart and the Collector's Edition, but it's mostly just text, so I won't be going into that here. Keep in mind there are going to be some story spoilers as I list these. That said, let's get started. The first difference can be spotted right after the title screen. The Japanese version has three save files instead of two. The reason for this is because the Japanese version lacks the ability to save at owl statues. You can only save by playing the Song of Time and resetting the clock. In the North American version, you are allowed to save and quit the game at any of the owl statues. Due to the extra memory storage for that kind of save data, the third file had to be dropped. It's unfortunate because the owl statues were rather complicated too. I personally just avoided them entirely. For the Japanese files, there's a counter for how many times you save the game with the Song of Time, whereas the North American version counts your rupees, hearts, and how many masks you have. There are also many audio differences, and I'm going to go over a few of the more noticeable ones. When the bombers walk in the North American version, they make this kind of bouncing sound. In the Japanese version, they make no sound. In the American version, the Skull Kid's cry is a global sound, meaning it plays at the same volume no matter what. In the Japanese version, the sound is bound to the Skull Kid, so the further the camera position is, the quieter it becomes. For the shop music, the Japanese version includes the intro, while the North American version does not. Consequentially, warping while in the shop in the Japanese version results in some minor distortion. In the Stone Tower and Stone Tower Temple, the music will stop playing at night in the Japanese version unless you warp there during the night. There's an annoying puzzle inside Great Bay Temple which forces you to time when you freeze some water in order to cross a water wheel, and can take several attempts. In the American version, the wheel always stops in the correct position. The clock at the bottom uses a 0 instead of a 12 in the Japanese version, and on the third day, instead of final, it reads last. When you use a transformation mask, Link will face the camera for the animation that plays. After it's over, Link will continue to face the camera in the Japanese version, whereas in the North American version, he will revert back to where he was facing before the mask was equipped. In the alien cutscene for the Japanese version, the cow has a nose ring. 
but for the North American version, the cow does not have one. In the Japanese version, Skull Kid has an entirely black face to match the Ocarina of Time, while in the North American version, a wood-like texture is used to match the rest of his body due to racism issues. The silver rupee chest in East Clocktown is placed slightly different between versions. The Marine Research Lab at Great Bay has its platform raised up a bit in the Japanese version, requiring you to jump out like a dolphin in order to get on top of it. In the North American version, you can simply swim forward and climb up. In the Pirate's Fortress for the Japanese version, there's a shortcut you can take after you shoot the beehive and clear the enemies from the room. Consequentially, the chest faces the opposite direction to account for the alternate route. The blocks at the entrance of the stone tower are arranged like a V in the Japanese version, and the switches on the temple side are removed entirely. They were presumably added in the North American version for convenience. And now for my favorite of them all. There's an entire section in the Japanese version which was removed for the North American version. In the Deku Palace, there's a hole in the ground which tunnels between the two wings. It is filled with Skulltula, Dark Bows, and Deku Baba. If you chose the courtyard on the right, you'll need to cross through it and make your way to another tunnel with a single Deku Baba. Go up the light, and drop down yet another hole to reach the bean cellar. In the American version, you need only stealth your way through the maze on the left till you reach the bean cellar's hole. In the Japanese version, if you throw yourself as Zora Link into the poison water in Woodfall, when you die, Zora Link will begin to burn, despite being in, you know, water. Spooky. North American version, you just die normally. Another weird one in the Japanese version is that as Deku Link, you can burrow yourself into the dirt road in Romani Ranch and pop out as if it were a Deku flower, but you will not deploy your pedal copter. This was probably made to assist with the killing aliens in the side quest, which it doesn't, by the way. It was removed in the North American version for its uselessness. And now for a few glitches only possible on the Japanese version. In the swamp shooting gallery, you can just roll over the fence as Goron Link. You can walk around where you're not supposed to, and there's no way to get out except for jumping into the void. The North American version has an invisible wall to prevent you from doing this. When you play the Honey and Darling minigame on the final day as Deku Link, all the C buttons are available to use, meaning you can use any item during this time. All of the non-transformation masks will just turn you back into Link, even the Giant's Mask. Most items will just make your game crash. The only items I found I could use were the Lens of Truth and the Ocarina. But the main use of this glitch is... Fierce Di- Hold on. Fierce Deity! Once you've got it on, disqualify yourself and walk out the door. Voila! You're free to go wherever you want as Fierce Deity. The guards won't let you past, but if you go to this guard and walk backwards until you see yourself clip into him, talk to him, and then you'll just walk outside. Congratulations! You can now venture Termina as a god. Act quickly, though. You've only got 24 hours to abuse it.
Playing the Hunting and Darling game on the first day also lets you throw as many bomb chews as you want, which will lead to some major lag, and can even cause the game to crash. In the North American release, it is limited to five bomb chews at a time. Whew. Majora's Mask has by far the most regional differences I've ever seen in a game before, and there's even more smaller stuff than what I've just listed. It also has a ton of cut content left within its files. So now we have to jump into an emulator in order to take a look at some of that sweet unused content. Wow, that looks so much nicer. Anyway. Seeing as Majora's Mask was made in only one year and used Ocarina of Time's engine, there are a few leftovers from Ocarina of Time, such as an adult Rudo. You can also spawn a red tech type. and a Shea Balm, aka Bubble. You can hack the ocarina to use the sound from Sheik's harp or Impa's whistle. There are also a ton of unused icons, such as the Fairy Ocarina, Fairy Slingshot, Hookshot, Blue Fire, Poacher's Saw, Broken Goron Sword, Prescription, Eyeball Frog, and Eye Drops. Glitching the camera inside the Iron Knuckle reveals Nibiru on the inside. There's another icon known as the Hylian Loach, and was probably intended to be used instead of the Seahorse in order to gain access to Pinnacle Rock. The instruments for all three transformation masks had their own icons as well, but instead only the Ocarina is used for all three. There's a fishing rod and mirror shield which are invisible, but work the same as they did in Ocarina. More often than not, though, they'll crash the game. There's a curious, fully functional green object which will push you away if you touch it, much like the bouncers in A Link to the Past. It's unknown what this would have been used for. Fun to play around with, though. Last but not least, there are some unused cutscenes of the Great Fairy actually training Link. The one you see here has her make Link do some exercises for the double health upgrade. There is no sound. The next one has her teaching you how to do the advanced spin attack, and then has you try it out yourself. That's all I got for you. There's quite a bit more stuff I left out, most because I couldn't recreate it or it was too boring, but there's a link in the description where you can take a look at a list of everything I didn't include, although I tried to show off everything that was interesting. Any way you play it, Majora's Mask is a great game. I hope you learned something new about it that you didn't before, and thank you for watching.